Uh, so right. welcome. Thank you, everyone. Uh, centers are supposed to be arriving momentarily, but we'll see what happens. Senator Brown. Senator is, is, is Brown. And this, we're, my name is Harvey Rishkoff. I'm with the American Bar Association. Folks, oh, folks, so please, so. conversations. <laughs> Focus on Harvey. Henry, thank you. Okay. Hey, Senator, why don't you come up? Thank you. Got you right here, Senator. Hey guys. Thanks for coming. Sir, how are you? Okay. Good to see you, sir. Good to see you. Uh, so, welcome this afternoon. Um, uh, my name is Harvey Rishikoff. I'm the uh, Senior Counsel of the Standing Committee on Law and National Security uh, from the American Bar Association. This is an issue that the association, uh, our committee, has been deeply focused on for a number of years. We even have Ben Powell here, who is a former member of the committee, among other things, who is actually sitting on the board. Uh, for the investigation, so we're very, very happy for you all to be here. We're also perfectly timed, thank you, Senator, to have the legislation come out uh, last night so that this is the subject of the topic, so it's perfect timing. If you will notice also, uh, Henry has a report out that um, came out in March, which is the overclassification, how bad is it, what's the fix, it's on your chairs. Um, and I want to thank, uh, your funder was Carnegie. Carnegie, Carnegie helped. They, they, they sent a representative to, to record the crime. Perfect. So um, the real reason we're here, though, is because of the senators in the bill. Uh, we'll let Henry say a few marks to introduce the senator. I think we'll start with you, Senator. I understand Senator Warner is supposed to be coming, but I know what your schedule must be like, so you'll be able to lead off. And as you know from the biography, uh, the senator is deeply involved in this issue, sitting on Sissy. I think it's a subject that is close to his heart and has been working on a variety of ways to try to make this better. So we'll do that and then we'll have some Q&A. If you can stay for that, it would be wonderful. And with that, Henry, please okay. take the floor. Well, it is an honor and a pleasure to be here and uh, I, I count myself as being very fortunate to know Harvey and so we have something to share today. Um, sure. Mr. Chairman's coming in, oh, so that's perfect. great. You know, we've got a full set here. <laughs> you know, three years ago, speaking uh, the mic, saying they can't hear. Three years ago, uh, my center, you know, initiated a series of meetings on the problem of overclassification, and we, I don't know, we had about almost 150 senior, former, current uh, officials and outside experts, you know, weigh in. The reports on your chair, along with a lot of other useful material, including ex an explanation of the bill, or bills, I should say, that just come out. Um, the group's report found that overclassification is robbing our frontline troops and allies of intelligence they need to fight and win, blocking our most innovative companies from keeping us ahead of our adversaries, hobbling our most leveraged military space programs, and my favorite, um, hollowing out public oversight as well as our military, diplomatic, and strategic historic memory. I think we can push back. We need to reduce the guidebooks we use to classify documents, and that's one of the themes you'll see in the report. We have at least 2,000 of them. Many are vague, contradictory. Unless we boil these down, we're never going to be able to automate to deflate the overclassification explosion. There's more in the report and more to be heard and discussed today. That's what we should do right now. Thanks. Senator Warner. Mr. Chairman, thank you for being here. As, uh, <laughs> <laughs> as you know, you've been at, at the heart of this issue. You carry many, many flags for us in, in the law, national security law space, including 702. You've been quite a student of this issue, and we can't thank you enough for passing the bill this morning, for uh, uh, issuing the bill this morning, so that it's perfect for our panel. So with that, we'll give you the floor to explain your approach, and then we'll have some well, after. Well, thank you, and um, thanks to the ABA, thanks to the Public Interest Classification Board, thanks for good friends like Glenn Gerstle, who's sitting here helping on some of this. And I thought, you know, you were giving me great news. I thought if we pass the bill this morning, we can all go home. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing my best. Yeah, so, uh, and I, I really appreciate um, some rounds being here. Mike is a new member of the. Intel Committee, but he's had distinguished service 
on the Armed Services Committee and, and really is an extraordinarily valuable member on this effort. I mean, how we got here, I think, you know, you guys probably are more familiar even than I am. This has been a, a problem for years. But it kind of fits into that, I think, fit for a long time into that category of it's a secondary problem, not a primary problem. Then we've had a couple things happen. Um, one, um, we had, and this has been something we've been working on as well, it's not gotten very much attention, except for certain within certain communities, how we make sure we do a better um, screening process for people to, to receive security clearances in the first place. I mean, and I actually think the Trump administration was very helpful on this. We used to have 750,000 person backlog, hurt us in terms of recruitment, hurt us in terms of ability for folks uh, in the contractor space to do their job. We made progress on that, but boy, I didn't think it was going to be a four or five year process, but we're still chipping away. Then we had the problem more recently, last fall, of the potential misuse of documents by a former president or current president or former vice president uh, that kind of moved this move this issue. Then we had uh, what I think was an extra spur was the um, recent leaks uh, that the Air Guardsman to share um, appears to have been deeply involved. All of that coalesced uh, a bipartisan group of us on the intelligence community to say it's time to actually um, put up a piece of legislation or a couple of pieces of legislation, one a little more narrow, narrowly tailored one that is, is much more extensive. And what we do in that legislation, and I think everybody's gotten a chance to take a look at it, and Mike, this is a group of uh, lawyers who will ask us all the details, so I'll be quick on that, my top end so you can get to the, the prodding and prying questions. Um, we said, first of all, somebody's gotta be in charge. The idea that each and every agency sets their own criteria of what needs to be classified versus not classified really doesn't make any sense, and it, it's leading to that the tsunami of documents. It's leading to the things that everybody here has already mentioned. It's leading to the fact that we can't even share with our allies. Uh, we all agree, problem. So we um, picked in there a variety of places this could have landed, but we ended up saying the ODNI office ought to be the, the entity that ultimately sets the standards and, and is the, the ultimate decider, number one. Number two, and, and this is, it was, is pretty aggressive, and, uh, and um, I know we've already given pushback, and I think if we'd done this bill, we'd get pushed back from whatever administration, because no administration wants to have this process meddled with by Congress. But number two, we put in a public interest test, where you have to, to weigh the public interest right to know versus the, uh, the, the national security concerns. And that test, which was actually uh, originally uh, proposed by Senator Moynihan back in the 90s, uh, I think is a, is a great starting point. Because what we have right now, I think we all know, is a default to classification. Um, because it's just easier, it's an easier way to CYA. Um, and so there's, there's no actual impetus to, to not classify. So this public interest test makes sense. We put in place a 25-year a requirement that says, all right, you got to declassify after 25 years unless the president or an agency had, um, um, you know, gives a specific reason. Will it get everything declassified? I'm not ready to go there. I know some of my colleagues want everything mandatorily declassified. I think there could be cases still of sources and methods, but at least it, it puts the pressure on, uh, on a declassification basis. It also says, all right, let's, and this is again, this is a, this is something I'm sure people can pick some holes in, but I think we're directionally right. It, we, in, in effect, almost put a taxation policy for agencies that overclassify. Now, we're not taking money away. We know that would never that'd be fully utilized, but it would say, all right, if there is this overclassification, those penalties would then be reallocated within that agency uh, to a fund for, for further modernization and, and digitization. Um, we also put in place, because of uh, the situation with um, uh, the most recent leak, a, a requirement to have consistent insider threat programs in place. I, I think it is very safe to say, um, candidly, because of some of the mistakes that were made in the past at the NSA, uh, that the NSA's you know, insider threat process is, is 
because they've learned the lessons, was much stricter, and an insider threat process that ought to include, um, you know, how often you use copy, and how often can you walk out with a bunch of documents without any requirement. You know, why in the heck does an IT specialist get to see all of these documents in the first place, as opposed to just the header? I mean, this is kind of like 101, and I don't think, um, and I know there'll be some folks from DOD saying, no, we had best practice. I don't believe that at a National Guard facility. But, but you know, uh, we put that in. And then finally, we, something that's generated, uh, I think, some of the initial press commentary, uh, which, again, is kind of a no-brainer in my mind, which says before a president or vice president packs up their boxes, which we all know was kind of done in a hurried fashion and, you know, kind of arbitrary decisions about what a personal document is versus a, you know, classified document. You know, the general rule of thumb has been if it's classified, you can't call it a personal unless you affirmatively declassify that. But saying, let's let the archivist actually get a review. I think most folks who don't want to make a mistake on classification would welcome that assistance uh, to make sure they don't get themselves put in a place that ends up being slightly uncom uncomfortable. There's a host of other smaller pieces, um, but why don't I why don't I leave it there and are we going to go to Senator Rabbit? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Okay. Senator Rabbit. Okay. Well, thank, thank you, and, and, and thank you for the opportunity to participate in this panel today. Um, Chairman Warner works the Intel Committee very well. It is bipartisan in nature. And for folks that look up here and, and, and they see nothing but partisanship and so forth, I can assure you that behind closed doors, there is true bipartisanship that occurs in that committee, as well as on the Armed Services Committee. And, uh, can we even give them the real secret? <laughs> no. Which is, we actually like each other. <laughs> <laughs> and now you're probably going too far. Right. <laughs> <laughs> now they're not going to believe anything we tell them. They made it an NDA. Okay. But yeah, I mean, look, it, it, it's, let me just begin by this. It's anything that we do in the Senate has got to be bipartisan or it doesn't go any place. Amen. And so uh, we start, from my perspective, I'm just going to tell you the story on why we want to make this happen. Uh, my own personal story on this. Uh, I watched as uh, we would go into a classified discussion, but we didn't have staff, our own staff, that could have a background on what we were doing. The United States Senate is staff driven. And if you want to get something done in a, in a Senate office, you have to have had communication between the staff members. But if the staff members can't get access to some of the material, the chances of getting that in front of a member of the Senate gets significantly reduced. What I found in terms of serving on the Armed Services Committee was that as a member, I had access to items that were significantly classified and you recognize that there are reasons why they're classified, it, in part because of the program itself. Uh, it, some of them are very, very sensitive. But there's also a matter of protecting sources and methods, which nobody wants to get in the way of. We absolutely have to protect sources and methods for how we get our intelligence. But we also want to make sure that we protect those significant programs that keep us on the cutting edge of technology. And we don't want to give away those secrets. China's good enough at getting our secrets the way it is. So we don't want to give up any more. So we're going to be very careful in that regard. But what I also found was is this degree, the secrecy that we had, was impeding our ability to find areas of opportunity when it came to coordinating authorizing committee members and appropriating members. And I want to give you one example. It's still there today. And that is with the issue of AI. Uh, in, in, in South Dakota, that would be artificial insemination. Mm. In Washington, D.C., <laughs> it is artificial intelligence. Okay? So, uh, artificial intelligence, there was a commission which was established more than two years ago, some of the brightest minds in the United States, if not the world, coming in and sharing their expertise about the direction that our country should go to enhance our abilities using artificial intelligence both the pros and the cons. And they did a marvelous job. And they put out two different reports, one of which was unclassified. And it's a good report. But the second report was classified at such a level that you basically, unless you were on a, so one of the select committees, you didn't get a chance to read it. I was privileged to be able to read it. And what I saw in there was opportunity to advance AI to the benefit of this country 
in a very rapid way. But it meant that appropriators would have to look at where they could spend money on behalf of the country. But if an appropriator could not get the correct classification or the cla or, or access to it to read it, there was no way they were going to be able to fund it. It was frustrating. And in fact, it's one of the reasons why last <coughs> year we came together, Republicans and Democrats alike, and it took a lot of it go it took us almost six months to do it. We now have within the United States Senate one member of each office has now the ability to apply for it to get a TS SCI clearance. Only one member, but that way that person can perhaps come in and get an advanced review of some of the more classified documents and then all they have to do is, is walk into their member and say, you, you really need to go and get this document. You really need to take time out of your schedule and sit down and read this. You need to get this briefing. They're held behind closed doors. Well, that member is not going to go get it if they don't know what exists in the first place. And the only way they find out about it is if a member of their staff tells them that it's, it's something they got to do. We found that last year. And now we have members that act, each member has one person, at least on their staff, who has access to TSSCI materials. Not necessarily SAP and not areas that have sources and methods in them to protect those sources and methods. My next step on this is, is this. Part of what AI can do for this country is to improve the quality of life when it comes to health care. But if you're going to improve health care, it means people in those committees have to have access to that same material, which is classified to such a degree that they can't get it, unless they have special permission from the leadership in the Senate to actually get that briefing. That's when you realize that there is a lost opportunity cost that has to be addressed. That's the reason why we got involved in this discussion in the first place. It is the reason why we have to continue to find the best way forward to protect the sources and methods and to protect our major programs from access, from prying eyes. But the vast majority of these new opportunities have to be appropriately funded and we've got to have the ability to communicate within our offices which ones deserve the funding, which ones should be reviewed, and which ones staff can handle directly without having a member's time involved. It may sound trivial, but we literally run out of time every single day. And to have the ability to have staff be able to share this with us in a more efficient manner will make us a better, um, a better organization here in the Senate. That's my story. Great. Thanks, Senator. I think you put your finger on the fact that the overclassification has even stopped the Congress to be able to perform its functions the way it should is oversight in a variety of ways. Uh, the last person <coughs> on the panel will be Ben Powell. Ben uh, sits on the Public Interest the Classification Board, so he's deeply concerned about these issues. Uh, I'll let him like a few months. I know he's read the proposed legislation and give you some thoughts and reflections about that. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Harvey. I'll just make be very short so we can get to any uh, any questions. Uh, the Public Interest Declassification Board uh, has written to the president that our classification and declassification system is in a state of crisis. Uh, we've written five reports since 2009 on this, and in June of 2020, put out a report on modernization suggestions for the digital age. Uh, we were heartened to see that many of those, uh, I hope, had uh, some contribution to the impressive legislation that was unveiled. Uh, many examples, and we all know them, uh, Senator Rounds gave important ones related to artificial intelligence. Chairman Warner mentioned uh, space in his remarks, and I'll just note, when you have the vice, then Vice Chairman of the Air Force saying, that the overclassification in the Department of Defense is ridiculous, unbelievably ridiculous. That tells you something about where our system stands and the importance of this legislation. All of the flaws that uh, Chairman Warner and Senator Rounds mentioned, of course, are demonstrated in what the DOD has said about what's going on in space programs in terms of cost, in terms of duplication of effort, uh, and in terms of, frankly, harming our national security and our ability to share information with important partners, both domestically and internationally. I'll just finally say we're greatly encouraged by this legislation. This is not a glamorous topic, uh, but it is a vitally important one uh, to the infrastructure and plumbing that underlies our uh, national security. 
uh, the community, both the intelligence community, the defense community, the energy department, and others, of course, are going to need resources, personnel, and frankly, commitment uh, if they're going to uh, indre- address this. So I would just say this is an incredibly important uh, piece of legislation, and uh, we're greatly encouraged uh, to see it unveiled. Great. Um, I'll ask the first question. One of the issues when one went <coughs> through the two proposed bills is the number of entities that are involved in coordinating the process that you guys have laid out. And part of that is also the amount of funding that you've allocated. And as Ben sort of raised that funding issue, I think you spend billions of dollars in classifications and very little on the declassification. So are you thinking of waiting that? Is that going to be something that's going to be addressed in the future? What is your sense about how that will be coordinated? Well, I, mean, well, I, I think you Right. I think we've seen, um, I think the number, and to call this five, five, five million, five million, five million, yeah. yeah, which is not going to be enough. Um, but I th- the overall cost of classification wasn't it eighteen billion? Is that it, it, depending how you do it, <coughs> it's, it's billions and billions of dollars. Right. We've seen an eighteen billion. Yeah. yeah. You know, and and yes, at the end of the day, the funding needs are going to are, are going to be bigger than we laid out, but we didn't want to. Yeah, the art of sausage making is we didn't want to scare people away with the price tag on the front end. No and if shot. we can do say, you know, if, if we can, you know, dramatically cut back, I think there is, there are savings. I do think, you know, the, one of the um, um, the notional proposals we've got of this, you know, almost quasi taxation regime right. within an agency yeah. that would, you know, yeah. again, this that will be in the details on how we get yeah. that. Uh, if it were to get through, how it gets implemented, but that could actually redirect some of the funds to make yeah. sure that right. on the declassification. Yeah. Just yeah. one thought on that also. It, it, the five begins it, but then after that it's uh, funds as may be needed. But right. along with that, let me just share with you, just to get them to move off dead center is it, critical. Mm-hmm. Uh, the National Geospatial Intel yeah. Uh, Organization, yeah. okay, uh, the NGA, they last in a couple of years ago, what they found out was anybody here serve in Afghanistan? How many Afghan vets we got here? Got a few. <coughs> okay. Afghan vets found out they're going to smile on this one here. Afghan vets found out that while when they got to Afghanistan, they needed overhead. They needed to be able to see the pictures of what's going on, on the ground. These folks here, they have spectacular abilities to show things, but it is so good they really didn't want the world to know how good their capabilities were. So they weren't sharing the pictures they were taking in Afghanistan. So what our vets have to do? They went out to the commercial market and bought commercially. What did the NGA figure out? They figured out that if they were going to survive, that they better be able to at least take these items and declassify them. Well, they've got 65 different guide guidebooks when it comes to classifications. It only took them five months to fix the problem. That was it. So this is a doable deal, and it can be made more efficient, and it's more than just the costs involved in classifying. It is, once again, the lost opportunity that we have right now that we are not assessing when we talk about how much it costs to declassify $5 million. Think about what it means just in terms of the ability to have uh, those capabilities if you're fighting in Afghanistan. And you need to see where the, the enemy is, and you've got to buy a commercial picture or to use commercial access rather than to have the finest that's out there because we really don't want anybody to know how good we really are. Those are the decision things that we have to address here. And echo what Mike just said is, you know, we also had a problem in Afghanistan of sharing with our partners, which, you know, their troops as well. Right. We have done better, and just suffice it to say that the quality of sharing in, in terms of the Ukraine cons- uh, conflict is better, but Mike's yeah. dead on that. Well, we were going to have Robert Cardillo, who was, you know, yes. director of NGA, and we have some NGA members here, <coughs> they went down from, I think, 56 or 65 uh, classification guides to two, but he's out, he couldn't get here because he's declassi- declassifying more documents, so right. there's another thing you couldn't get here. But let me ask Henry to ask a quick question. I was very pleased to see in your bill that after 20 years, you were going to give him some money, dedicated <laughs> staff. Now, the Public Interest Declassification Board is probably a bigger secret 
than most of this SAP programs. Now, you have made a big mistake in letting people know that it exists and you want to fund it. I've got a question for you. How would you like to use them? Because I think they should be used, but I want to know what, what you guys think you, you should use them. Well, I, I, I would say, look, at the perfect <coughs> system, in, in my opinion, would be if we had uh, committees within the House and the Senate that were basically subcommittees of Intel, Armed Services, and so forth to actually have oversight of it. But if not, the next best thing would be to have this be kind of that advisory board to mm -hmm. actually take and to look at the at, at the different approaches and hold the agencies accountable for actually getting some of this stuff done and explaining why or why not they're getting uh, things automated, but also the fact that um, that there is a process which is going on. If the if the NGA can do it, the other organizations can do it as well. And, and I'd simply add, if we are successful in putting in this um, you know, public interest test on that initial decision, whether classify or not, we ought to have somebody that's going to be informed enough to potentially arguing the public interest and the right to know side, and that's where I think the, um, the board would come in. So at this point, I'd like to open up to questions. Do we have any press that want to sit there? Go ahead, sure. <coughs> Yes, a straightforward question. Um, what do you see? Why don't you say um, who you are for the <laughs> uh, Rachel Oswald, uh, CQ roll call. Um, what do you see as far as um, timelines for this? Do you think this could be offered as an amendment to the NDAA? Um, are you, or, or is this kind of maybe a next year bill? And um, what do you sense about where the House stands? Well, let me um, kind of all of the above. Um, you know, could we take we did this uh, initially with with only Intel committee members. We didn't kind of broaden the aperture. We let his gap know, and our hope would be that you know a group there would embrace this as well. Um, we've not done a major socialization with the House yet, but we know there are you know, a, a large cohort of people who are interested in this issue, and whether it got in total attached or whether we got pieces of this that went into the NDAA or the Intel Authorization Act. You know, we're actively working, at least what I've got some jurisdiction over, the Intel Authorization Act, are the component parts that we can that we can put in. But part of this, again, let me be, be, be honest and not to argue that you know, s some of this stuff, whether the public interest test and or the notion of, of a penalty uh, for an agency for overclassification. I mean, that's going to stir up some controversy. Uh, and and um, as we're aware, you know, we warned the administration this was coming. We didn't get their full sign off again. I think in a very bipartisan way, any administration would probably push back on some of this just because they don't want Congress messing with us. But the idea that the status quo uh, is working, and I give you know Director Haynes credit for um, you know, calling out the problem. Yeah, look, I, I'm going to agree with the chairman, and I, I, I would suggest one thing, though. I think we have to socialize this, not just uh, with the House members, but I think we're going to have a lot of, of Senate members that are going to want to learn more about it. Uh, and then I think we're going to have to go back in and answer questions. And I, I can see where this is a starting point, but we're going to have an opportunity to make modifications to it. Uh, well, we don't have all the answers yet. And, and remember, we're still looking at the investigations that are going on about what happened with regard to, or what has to be addressed with regard to the the, uh, the documents that were found to be in inappropriate locations through multiple administrations, but also then the most recent leak of documents, uh, you know, with regard to the, the uh, war in, in Ukraine and so forth. That Those are all items that will help improve this particular process. So, yeah, it'd be great to be able to include it, but I'd rather do it right. And if it takes a full year to get it done, so be it. So I know the center's tight for leaving, but I'll take out one more question. 
Um, I have a, Mike Brundage from the University of Maryland, <coughs> uh, Applied Research Lab for Intelligence and Security. So I have a question about declassification tools. So you obviously referenced the Conga effort with NGA. There's been other efforts with things like using natural language processing or artificial intelligence to improve declassification coming from DOE. Uh, UT, ARL had some work. We actually even have some work as well. So it actually hits on Harvey's question related to coordination. So how can we coordinate kind of these individual efforts that are going on across the government and bring them together to have lessons learned, even improve more research in the future, and then also help with acquisition and implementation? That's classified. A good way of putting it. I like that. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. we're going to need your help. I mean, you know, everybody in this room, including Mike, is probably a bigger ex expertise than I have in this area. Third, third grade level. So, so grade you level. know, how we get it right, and we need your input. Um, you know, we are bringing in next week some of the, you know, the, the, the senior most AI leaders to talk at, uh, with the, the Intel community's leadership, not their tech people, but their leadership. Part of that will be this kind of question, you know, how, how can we use these tools? You know, I don't want people coming in pitching a, pitching a product, but can we make sure we wrap our heads around all this? But we're going to well, I, I think that there's another second part of it is, is for documents that already exist and then for documents moving forward. I think we can fix the process for documents moving forward through this process. That's a step. And then based on that, we'll put together data sets uh, and we'll be able to look back at that stage of the game over a period of time. But the data sets today, we, we don't have that. And so I, I think, you know, let's be honest, we, we have to build that. And, it, it will take a number of different a number of different organizations that fill fill in the data sets on existing ones moving forward, and then we can start to fill in behind it. For historians, I think that's going to be critical. But move, moving from this point forward is critical for our operational needs within the Senate and the House. And and I just and I'll I'm on, I'll take one more question, but I, I know I got people on the steps. But I one of the things that's been a a a um, learning lesson for me on how this is going to be a, a, a bit of a slog was uh, is the security clearance reform <laughs> I mean you know <laughs> the, yeah well we, we, we did get it out from 750,000 we got the process of continuous vetting right. what does continuous vetting mean in an internet age yeah. I mean you know we have made progress but I did not think it was going to be a 10-year career move for me to get in, in security <laughs> clearance reform, whether I'm taking on and whether Mike and I are taking on another 10-year <laughs> process on declassification and classification reform, yeah. we may be inviting inviting that. We have Rosenwasser on it, so that's... I know, and I, how when you guys be? said yeah. that somehow yeah. that this is not sexy, yeah. you just, you know, John Rosenwasser faculty, yeah. his jaw fell. Uh, I know. Yeah. He thinks this is about, he thinks this is very sexy. No question, page one. Sir, last question. Hi, uh, Dustin Bolt with the Wall Street Journal. Uh, I, for one, think this is very sexy and glamorous. Uh, thank you for doing it. Um, <laughs> just a uh, follow up to something you mentioned about the Biden administration not greeting this warmly. I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on uh, if, if they've indicated there would be any sort of uh, 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 tweaks or meddling in, in classification or security, security clearance reform that they would be receptive to. I think, as you know, they have been working on their own executive order on classification issues, but it sounds like that's maybe slowed. Are they open to anything yeah. or what? Well, let me, let me um, better uh, clarify my initial answer. Yeah. Um, we have only heard back from one component of the intelligence community. So we've not gotten a formal response from the White House. We've not gotten a formal response from the ODNI. I just know historically, um, you know, administrations, and I think it's really important to say, there would have been the same pushback from the Trump administration, from the Biden administration, from the Bush administration. It just, you know, that's the nature of the beast that the administration does not want uh, Congress meddling. Two, but the status quo wouldn't, isn't gonna, isn't gonna, can't stand either. You know, three, on, on security clearance reform, the administration has been a great partner. Both the Trump administration and the Biden administration have been great partners as we move towards, you know, uh, the notion that we're not going to simply 
repoly everybody five years. We're going to have this process of continuous vetting, you know, and we are at now. I think uh, we're supposed to be working to 2.0, but we're at 1.5, and you know, it's again, it takes longer than we'd like, and still kind of, uh, you know, we, we still are missing the the uh, ability if you've got clearance in one agency to have it to another reciprocity and there may always be a problem with CIA but at least on the balance there ought to be reciprocity and we didn't have reciprocity even within DHS it was kind of crazy mm -hmm. um, so uh, you may want as a, you know uh, to, to ping the administration and see what kind of talk <laughs> <laughs> uh, what what have you heard so far uh, crickets <laughs> <Pardon>? crickets <laughs> well, that's, that's better than a flame, a flame <laughs> <laughs> Last word, sir. Yeah, look, 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 sources and methods have to be protected. Yeah. And so as we move through this, do no harm, but also recognize the opportunity that we are missing now to save lives and to promote a, a, a better economy in this country, uh, to promote a better defense in this country, and to actually provide additional insight as to how good some things actually were are all items that you have to weigh. But once again, do no harm. The do no harm is in place today, but there is not a recognition really of the lost opportunities because of the overclassification. I think in a nutshell, that's really where we're at, what we're trying to accomplish. And can I have one other thing just to, that I think is, because these are not related, but are related. You know, we are, and with some of you in this room, have been actively engaged. Um, you know, we got a long, long way to go to make sure we get 702. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, we committed, and boy, oh boy, the value of 702 today is even exponentially greater than it was a decade ago. And not just in anti-terrorism, but in terms of great power competition. There's also a whole host of reforms that have been taking place on 702 that I don't think most Americans and, and most members of Congress even realize. And making that message clear is, is something we all have. If we are at the same time moving towards less classification and more willingness to say the public interest has a right to know, I do think that helps us in the 702 debate. Mm -hmm. So they. You know, all of these these panels around gaining the American public's trust uh, that these tools are going to be used carefully and 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 not widely uh, against any group of Americans, and that you know that the CIA doesn't really know where the secret of Bigfoot is and not been being kept kept secret. Um, you know, proving that we're we're good stewards of information. Uh, I think it does help us on seven. Great. And I, I, I'm going to leave Mike so on here, but I apologize. Sure, thank you so much for the half the ADA and MTEC. We appreciate it. Thank really, you. really want to thank you for what you two guys are doing because you're showing bipartisan action to live in 2020. And, by, and I also want to make sure I give a, a shout out to uh, John Cornyn as well, who's oh. another better a, a leader. Okay. Obviously, Ron Wyden and Jerry Moran. And thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll take a, a little bit. We have Ben Powell and Henry here. If you have any more questions or want to discuss anything in the report, please feel free and fire away. There's an outside uh, chance the Senator Manchin may be coming as well. Okay, but we'll have to I, see about that. You know, any, any other questions, uh, Ben? Do you have any more thoughts, uh, given where you sit what you, and your reactions to the, to the proposed legislation, what you like and really like? Well, just very quickly, um, because we fall into uh, jargon and everything whenever we talk about this. I'll say and the report of the Nonproliferation Policy Education Center, somehow they got permission from the government and Sandia Labs to republish their slides. So on the NGA slides, uh, on the consolidated uh, uh, classification guide, uh, what they had in place and what they have now, very interesting uh, if you want to learn more about it. Uh, there's also slides in there from uh, Sandia uh, around the idea of, of AI, use of natural language processing, and other of these. So there's some very, uh, in addition to the report itself, that backup material with primary source material from some places that you rarely see slides uh, being published are very interesting. So I won't go through all the NGA pieces, but that is uh, you know, an example that many people talk about and is, uh, and is left in there. And I, I think the importance of this 
you know, legislation is, is that it is starting the conversation. I do think in terms of the administration, as you know, Director Haynes uh, has raised this as a very important issue. So it is not something, uh, so it is something that we have seen maybe uh, for one of the first times in terms of Director Haynes, of course, traveled down to Texas uh, to the Johnson Library and the Clement mm -hmm. Center for National Security to give a speech uh, at the conference directly addressing uh, overclassification for the PIDB event we, we held down there. So, you know, that the fact that she was willing to take that time to go down to speak about this issue, about the importance that it has for her and how she sees that as a problem for, for the community and for national security says something about uh, where it sits on her sure. priority list. And, and you don't see that necessarily from other uh, leaders of the intelligence community in the past, um, just simply because of the tyranny of the inbox and all the important things they have to deal with. So I don't know what the administration's reaction to the legislation will be. A lot of it is, uh, part of it is codification of things in executive orders and other pieces giving a statutory mandate to certain organizations, so we'll, we'll just see what the um, what that is. But, you know, to date, it seems like both DOD and Director Haynes have been public in ways that I haven't seen in many decades mm -hmm. in talking about this problem as not just a problem of, well, we have all of this backlog of material, but as we mentioned about in space operations and other things, seeing this as a problem with current national Security and how it is actually doing harm in our ability uh, to advance the ball as centered around said yeah. technology in other areas. So this is not just perhaps as it might have been looked at in the past as like, well, we have some dusty archives and there's more <laughs> things being added to the dusty archives. So don't we need to declassify the the the, the archives for historians at some point? All of that was very important. All of that's part of the public transparency. But it seems like this is now moving to a more current and more urgent issue actually affecting our operations and national sure. security. Senator Rounds talked about the situation in Afghanistan. Uh, I was in government during Afghanistan, during Iraq, and all these pieces, and a lot of different issues that I saw in the overclassification world and the sure. ability to share with our international partners. Well, I mean, I'd like to build on that. I mean, three years ago, I mean, I started this as a result of a personal experience I won't get into. Let's just say, uh, the problem of overclassification is more bizarre than you can imagine. It's not, it's worse than what you heard today, is my view. Um, and it gives vent to a lot of mismanagement, to be blunt, that we should not tolerate. This is our government. I think what's changed is precisely what you, you said. Instead of us thinking about classification as something for you know, footnotes for buddies and scholarship, it's turned to something in the future, which is how are we going to wage information campaigns? How are we going to share uh, with equals rather than uh, you know, protectorates the kinds of information we need to win against adversaries who are going to possibly get into a hot war with us? All of that is much more demanding and new and I think we're turning our gaze to it. I have to say, if it wasn't for that 21-year-old, I'm not sure we'd be here. Well, I think one of the issues that was raised is this is all like a huge snake. And the other issue that many of us have been involved in is the, was highlighted by the chairman is the concept of clearances. The clearance system is broken, the same way the overall classification issue is broken. And they're tied together mm -hmm. because people get in trouble in clearances discussing issues that they do not think are classified, do not to be classified, and next thing you know, they're pulling their badges. So it really is endemic to the system, and it's great to start trying to approach the problem. Uh, Director Haynes is a bit of a unicorn because she's an attorney and a physicist, and actually sat on our ABA standing committee for a number of years where she was a member. And she, I think, is a member who clearly understands, as you said, the importance of the problem. Do you have any other questions that you guys like to ask? Or would you, yes, go ahead, sir. Hi, Jim Dalvo with Congressman Austin Scott's office. Sure. Is there an ally or a partner around the world that gets declassification, overclassification right there? Well, 
So we don't have to mean that the uh, yeah. yeah. There is an Australian chapter yes. in, the, in the book, and I'll let Henry discuss the uh, Australian approach. Let me give you the uh, good news and then the bad news. The good news is the Australians uh, reduced the number of classification categories they have, which, in my book, we should do. We're adding them. It's absurd. My favorite is, what is it, controlled unclassified information. CUI, as you know yes. it is. That's your laundry list, okay, or your menu for the evening. I'm kidding a little, but they use that and have uh, at times to keep things from Congress, which is not right. They got rid of several categories, and everyone pretty much ignored the reform, and then COVID hit, and they couldn't get to their machines to hit the classified button. And all of a sudden, everything was working perfectly. Oh, you want to know what the bad news is now? They got over COVID and they went back to the office. Uh, it suggests that if we want to solve this problem, perhaps we should create some kind of illness that would keep people from going to the office so much. It might be helpful. There is a instinct and inclination when you're in front of that machine to press those buttons and not think. So you can reform the, the, the various uh, rules and guides and even reduce the number of clearances. But if you don't get people to understand that overclassification harms our security, I don't care what tool you come up with. Well, well, they won't yeah. use it properly. Part of the issue which I think the, makes the legislation intriguing is the shifting of the burden. Because when I used to do counterintelligence when I was at NCIX, Everything that I did in an email came with the classification. I was doing a lunch meeting on the system. It, the fault had to be classified. So what the, what the, what the legislation is, is shifting the default. So the default will be, the assumption is you should be able to declassify the material in the interest for public interest test. And you have to make an argument why it should be classified. Right now we have a system where you have to make an argument why it should be unclassified. So it really, sh in the legal terms, it shifts that burden. Yeah. And then the second issue, the assumption is, after 25 years, again, you have to carry the burden as to why it falls under one of the exceptions, why it wouldn't be made public. And thirdly, we're Americans, so we always believe that there will be a technological fix. solution and fix. And this issue of the AI and testing different types of programs that will be able to declassify documents on scale, given how much is classified, is going to be the test to see whether or not this legislation is able to really cut through the dent of the paper, and be, will there be technology that will really assist people in doing it? Now, there is another view on that, and I think everyone needs to be aware of it. And that is that the inanimate objects in our life don't actually solve the problem. They are tools. Not only that, I'm going to go further. The legislation, if it should pass in the House, the last I heard, they're part of the constitutional system we have. They have not said boo yet, so they may have other ideas. May not be the one and done, and I don't think the technical things will be one and done. We will, in fact, start soon, I hope, what I would call, uh, there's a guy named Steve Blank who calls this innovation theater. And I'm all for that, because you do need that tool. But we've got to get a demand signal into the executive branch to want to do these things and use these tools when they're perfected. And that depends probably more on the press and the Congress than they appreciate. So Ben, one of the questions for you is to come in any of this, but if we could have a magic wand, what would you use that wand for? in order to build up the resources of the public interest in classification board. Oh, wow. Um, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, first, there's some fixes to the, to the board that are in the legislation, yeah. particularly around um, the board has had an uh, un uneven uh, operating history. At one point, uh, fell out of authorization um, uh, completely and went into complete dormancy. 
Uh, and then, of course, uh, we were down to two members at one point. Um, so there's some just legislative technical fixes that I don't think are controversial around uh, once members' terms uh, expire, you're off, uh, unlike in many boards where uh, you continue to serve until a replacement is named and cleared, uh, except for talking about clearances. Of course, any time you have something that requires uh, high-level clearances, TSSCI clearances, uh, that can take a while, and so that's one of the fixes in this legislation. So by magic wand, there's just some basic fixes to the board that need to happen. Um, we've got some people from the National Archives here in the Information Security Oversight Office, and they do, uh, they, if anyone knows about ISOO, they have an incredible mandate, uh, classification government-wide, and are no way resourced uh, to do that job. And on top of that, uh, we add on to their burden uh, supporting the board <laughs> and uh, doing things like the report that actually resulted in, I think, uh, we hope made contributions to this legislation around modernization of the, of the uh, declassification and classification system. It's available on the PIDB website. Uh, so those would be, I think, the important things in terms of uh, resources and fixes to the board. Uh, to ensure that ISU has its resources, the board has the resources to support this work. Congress in recent years has added mandates to the board uh, without a budget or without uh, supporting resources. That has included now a study on uh, uh, nuclear testing and fallout in the Marshall Islands. Uh, you can read that report if interested. That was a huge effort, um, largely uh, among staff uh, at ISO who had many other tasks at the same time. So those would be the kind of fixes um, that we would look at on AI, just to return to that for a moment. It is a tool. Uh, the board has looked at different technology issues over the years and talked about them both on the blog and in our reports. And I'll, I'll just say very briefly that there's a lot of things we're talking about using artificial intelligence and machine learning for in terms of self-driving cars and healthcare and very what I would call high-end things. We are looking at using this and I would hope the community looks at using this to process text. We're not asking it to drive cars, we're not asking it to fly planes, we're not asking it to do these things. We're asking it to do text recognition and then obviously do a lot of complexity and processing around understanding where this may fit in the classification system and whether it's appropriate for declassification. So this is, to my mind, uh, right in the prime sweet spot with these incredible advances of AI and machine learning in this golden age we're going to be in. Uh, this is a prime application for this. So we're not looking to be uh, at the frontier of you know, robots dancing and <laughs> driving cars, flying planes, doing surgery, those kinds of things. We're asking to do something that should really be in the prime sweet spot of this technology when you look at what the private sector does with using AI and, and text recognition and text processing. I think there's a lot we can learn, learn there. Right, and as you know, it's being battle tested by major law firms in litigation now. All right. So that's sort of an intriguing issue. But more questions, sir. Um, yeah. So I have a follow up to it. I agree with what Henry was saying in terms of like the culture, right? The culture is to over classify currently. But I also think there's a culture, right, to fight the tools that you're mentioning. So how do you address that if you want to do this right and you want to kind of attack that culture issue of changing their current processes? I think it's really important, this is going to sound off, but I work in the Pentagon, okay? And, and, and it, it's, a, it's an interesting large organization. I assume working in the intelligence community is equally interesting. And what I mean by that is if you don't have a sense of humor and you don't have someone who's persistent in various places that gets what's going on. I mean, I briefed one of the senators here yesterday. And he said, well, how do you see it? And I said, well, we should be so lucky as to think that our problem is China. That's easy. If you don't fix this, game over. And I don't think people see it that way. Well, I think it's real to how we understand what an informed public is, how we have a true informed democratic debate. Uh, any more questions? 
Well, I do have one now. Oh, we, oh, we know what's the center one. Quick. So Senator Warner talked a little bit. Say who you are. Oh, sorry. I'm I'm Brad Gates. I actually worked on Conga along with that. Uh, you, you might I tell help. people what. Oh, uh, Conga's the. <coughs> look at the, the dance. Yeah, the mm -hmm. acronym. Dance. This is an acronym free zone. It's an acronym for a consolidated NJ classification guide. It's the slides <laughs> that we developed are actually in the report right. along with Taylor, Mike, and um, right. Steve in the back. So, uh, Senator Warner talked a little bit about like a tax. Uh, whatever that means, on, on overclassification. Is there anything in the legislation or is there anything anybody's been talking about, about the back end of that in terms of having some sort of protection for the individuals that are actually trying to drive lower classifications that aren't going to drive lower classifications because they're afraid they're going to get an unauthorized disclosure and then personnel security is going to come crashing down on them, they could potentially lose their job, their clearance, livelihood. Etc. That really is the very mm -hmm. simple explanation as to why overclassification exists in the federal government. What is being done to address that side of the house? Well, we're, hold, we're holding this meeting, and it's being taken. So I think what's helpful about that is, as you're saying, is if the default is going to be it needs to be unclassified. The theory is the person who wants to maintain a classification at what level. They have to make the case. And then, the, as you're saying, if the case is not made or doesn't carry the day, there needs to be a process in which those individuals who say, I'm following the law, if this becomes a law, that there's some safe harbor. That you have to demonstrate there had been a process, an argument made to keep the document classified. At that point in time, it was considered not a winning argument. It became unclassified. And it, they also have in the document, if it turns out that that was an error, it can be reclassified, but it has to again carry a very strong burden of proof to make sure that you can do it. But I think what your your question is: Will there be a process that protects those individuals in order for them to make the argument or reject an argument for classification? That's going to be, I think, the sticking point as you put your finger on it. We also have some ISU members. Would they like to uh, join the? The fray here. I, I'm a, a law professor, so I cool call all the time. So, uh, <coughs> anyone from my school would like to talk about anything that they'd like to deal with? No, we're good. No, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> I might. Yeah, you know okay. that's not true, but that's great. <laughs> I yes, I was ready. I mean, the, the reason I wrote the report is we had had all these meetings. I spent a certain amount of money, and I felt guilty. You know, maybe I should write up the findings, and so I did. I was not planning to bother with this topic. Uh, it seemed to me to be you know, pretty much a lost cause. I think at some level it still is. But because of the events, um, I have to hand it to the Wall Street Journal. I, I owe you something. I don't know what. Well, we're on the record, so let's keep it. Yeah, well, I mean, that they decided to spotlight this thing. And then, luckily, we had this disaster. I think. It, there's a real need for the folks without clearances outside of the government, that would be people like me, but there are others besides me, to actually hold meetings and get these kinds of points out. I don't think enough attention is being paid to this. I think that may have changed now, and we have to you know, get to the point where it isn't just for breakfast, but for every single meal. We have to start talking about this at every turn. I think that's the significance of today's meeting, I hope. I'll let Ben have the last word. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say um, um, thank you, Andrew, for the report and these pieces. I think there's been a lot of jumping off and momentum here. Uh, I mentioned Director Haynes coming to the board's meeting uh, in Texas and speaking about that. and. You know what the board what we've tried to do to build on these things to bring attention to these issues so i think all of these pieces coming together uh and obviously the hard work of the staff of the senate intelligence committee in yeah. pulling pulling this together and bringing bringing attention to it and that's what we need to build on uh to keep this going great, great. well for the record i want to thank henry and npec for their lovely report sponsoring this is wonderful well i also want to i want to also thank him because i wrote a chapter he's a very light editor and i always appreciate that <laughs> do these things so you can but, send your editorial comments yeah. mm -hmm. but i also think if you're thinking of beach reading 
This is something that's perfect, the way it's bound, so you can get sand <laughs> and still be cleaned off, so you can pass it around for gifts. And I particularly, for the record, want to thank the senators for having spent the time to come and do this, well, and all of the yeah. extraordinary staff that make this happen. Yes. And particularly NGA for helping to set. Uh, but it's clear that could be done. May yeah. I add that there was an awful lot of support from Senator Rounds as well. Absolutely. And I, you know, to be Absolutely. honest, um, we're lucky. So, to so both the senators, the chairman and the senator, and to the press that came, and hopefully we'll keep this alive. And I know there are many people who will be more than happy to talk to you on the record and off the record if you so choose. So, okay. with that, thank you so much. I'll give you half an hour back. Thank you. And before you move, you take lunches back to your office. Yes. And or take the lunch home for dinner, but please feel free to take it. Thank you. How do you turn this on?